Um, hi, everybody. 
Nice to see you here tonight. Hi, Dolores. Steve Gonzo. Nice to see the two of you. Hi, Kay. Hi, Joe Segura from New Mexico. Nice to see you. Hi, Deborah Wilson, Kate Clark, and Dale Weaver. Great to see you. Hi, Lana. How you doing? Happy 5th of July, <laughs> of course. Hope you had a good time this weekend. I know it's harder than you. It was probably harder than usual to have a good time. We contented ourselves with not going to where crowds are. Avoiding crowds. Respecting the greater vulnerability of our age. And doing things we like. So tonight I want to discuss, well, I'll ask and then discuss the question of how the U.S. is performing in a comparative context. In other words, how are we performing compared to other nations? And I'll be dealing with various um, issue areas, COVID-19, the economy, government performance, civil liberties and rights, uh, the area of Medicare for all, and oligarchy. Of course, this can't be comprehensive because time is too short, but I'll be discussing various things that um, hit my radar in the last uh, two or three days. Kay says, I stayed in the house. <laughs> Hope you had a good time anyway, Kay. It must have been awfully hot. It was awfully hot here in the last few days. So... Uh, let's get started. We're going to get started with COVID-19. And we're going to share screen for this one. and start out by looking at some statistics on cases and deaths by country, territory, or conveyance. This is from the Worldometer's uh, site. And you can see lots of new deaths in certain areas. Boy, Brazil was hit hard, wasn't it? 535 new deaths. One sixth of the new deaths in the world went to Brazil. Uh, what I like to fun focus on here is deaths per million population. I'm going to take away some columns to make this look better. I'm not going to include the tests in here. I like to focus in on the bottom line, which I consider to be deaths per million um, per population. Case like um, the San Marino, a very small place, 
Okay, an outlier. Andorra also. Uh, but number two is Belgium. Is a nation of 11 and a half. Oh, oh, that's a nation of 11 and a half million people. And they have 843 deaths per million. Very high. Ignoring Andorra and San Marino, we next time come to the UK. 651 deaths per million. Spain. is at uh, 607 deaths per million. Um, um, Italy is at uh, 577 deaths per million. Sweden is at 537 deaths per million. France, 458. The United States, 400. So discounting the very small countries, the U.S. is uh, seventh in the world and quite high and still going up. In the other nations, if you look at new cases, okay, in the other nations, uh, which I have, you see that compared to the United States, okay, the new cases are very low in the UK, even in Belgium. Um, um, and, okay, in Italy, but in the United States, they're at 43,000. Now, uh, if, if you controlled for population here, you'd see that the new case number here in the United States is enormous and that means more deaths in the future than uh, these other nations uh, you see there were very few new cases in the Netherlands only one additional death there that's a nation of 17 million people. Uh, just looking at this should give you the correct impression that even though there are many deaths per million in many of the European nations, their curves have been bent. So even when you look at the deaths per million, okay, of those nations, then you look at the new cases and you know that they flattened uh, their curves. And if, if you saw the reproduction rates, the R0 statistic for each of these countries, uh, you would see that right now the R0 um, the four of the European countries, other than Sweden, are less than one right now. So the number of new cases, that means, is declining okay, in those nations. Whereas in the United States, it is going up uh, rather rapidly. Rather rapidly, um, indeed. Now, this is true even for uh, for Ireland. Okay, you can see the figure here for Ireland is pretty high, 353 deaths per million. But, okay, in their nation of uh, 5 million people, you see only 18 uh, new cases. Of course, if they were the size of the United States, there would be hundreds of new cases. But, there would not be thousands of new cases, and certainly not 43,172. The curve in Ireland is also flattened.
So you see Chile, a nation of 19 million people, comparable to the Netherlands in size. 3,685 new cases, 73 of, um, by four of the Netherlands. Okay, you see Chile is one of those cases, uh, is one of those nations where its cases are rising rapidly. And Peru the same. Brazil is going out of control. They have a big population, 212 million, about uh, two-thirds of the United States. Uh, and they are, okay, are increasing almost as fast in Brazil in terms, okay, of new cases. Uh, if you control for population. And the deaths, okay, the new deaths in Brazil are higher than in the United States. So Brazil is in real bad trouble, as is the United States. There's no new case data, okay, for Ecuador. But we see their total deaths have been um, fairly substantial and deaths per million, 271 per million. Um, substantial. So you see that the United States is among the worst in the world and getting worse. It's not out of the realm of possibility that in one month's time, within one month's time, that we will surpass in deaths per million uh, very many of the European countries that we are behind right now. Now, that probably will not be the case uh, with Sweden. You see Sweden, the nation okay, of 10 million, has 537 deaths. They don't tell you what the new cases are there, and they don't tell you what the new deaths are there. But if you looked at Sweden okay, a few weeks back, it wasn't 537 deaths per million. It was under 400 then. So new deaths have been spiking in Sweden recently. They may not be reporting the new cases. They may not be reporting the new deaths. But if you looked at uh, this table uh, just a few weeks back, uh, we were behind them then. But uh, we were somewhere around, I don't know, 350 deaths per million. They were something like 437 deaths per million or something like that. Now they're at 537 deaths per million. So Sweden is still going up very fast. Uh, as you know, they have not made very vigorous efforts to uh, contact trace. Okay. And uh, uh, to test and to get in control of the virus. They've been following a kind of a herd immunity type of strategy, relying on their healthcare system, relying on the fact that a lot of Swedes, okay, are living alone, but they've paid a heavy price in deaths per million. They continue to pay that price. They and the USA will probably, within a month or two, pass in deaths per million, France and Italy and Spain. I don't know if they'll get to the level of the UK yet, but that will come pretty close. We in Sweden both will come uh, pretty close. Sweden is probably moving up even faster than the United States. So there are two aspects of performance with respect to the coronavirus. There's the aspect of where you are now and where you've been in the past. And there's also the aspect of what is likely to happen in the future 
uh, as measured by the R naught figures for these particular countries. I won't be going into the R naught as yet, but what I want to do here is I want to highlight the successful countries. Now, sometimes it's hard to know because countries are hiding their data, or obviously not producing very good data. But we would expect a good performance from a country such as um, Denmark, and we certainly have that compared to Sweden, okay, a similar country. But we still have 105 deaths per million. That is not a good performance. I think I did something... I should not have done. Let me get this down there again and see what I've lost. Oh. Sorry, I lost my place here inadvertently. Let me see if I can get my table back. Yes, I did. Okay. So, I was at Denmark. And I was pointing out that even though Denmark looks pretty good from the standpoint of Sweden, it's still 105 deaths per million. I would not call that a good performance. And now Germany is slightly higher at 105 per million. But I still wouldn't call that a good performance. Now it's good relative to the United States, but it's not a good performance for an advanced nation. When do we get to something we might call a good performance for an advanced nation? where we can count on the data. We pretty much count on the data. Well, Norway is at 46 per million. That's about one-tenth of our debts. Obviously, if we had that kind of performance, we would be much happier than we are today here. They're a nation of 5.4 million. They have 46 deaths per million. We can count on their statistics, I think. I don't think they hide their statistics or falsify their statistics in general. We see that Israel appears to be doing better than Norway at 36 deaths per million. But Norway seems to have flattened their curve. Their are new cases, but only four. Whereas Israel had 788 new cases, a very sizable amount for a country of uh, about 9 million people. Uh, so Israel may be in a spike right now don't know exactly what the situation is there, but I hesitate then to call that a good performance, okay, at this point. Argentina has a lot of new cases for a country of uh, 45 million people. That's a lot okay, of new cases. So I still wouldn't characterize them, okay, as having good performance. Well, now we get to number 75 on the list, and it's uh, Chechia. And they have 32 deaths. I think that's the uh, Czech Republic, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, let me go further. 
Liechtenstein, which is tiny, of course, has only 26 deaths per million. That's told that's only one. <laughs> Okay, many of these countries I'm skipping over because I think I'm right to assume that the statistics are, are not really reliable for those countries. I don't know how reliable they are for Greece these days either, because Greece has been in poverty for a long time now. They supposedly have only 18 deaths per million, but I won't count on the statistics. Nor would I count on the statistics okay, from India at this point but india is certainly going through a spike it has 23,932 new cases once again we ought to remind ourselves of the new cases for the united states and we have 43,000 So India is going through a spike. Uh, maybe the virus was slow to get to India. Maybe India has just not been actually reporting the actual deaths from the virus, conflating that uh, with other deaths. I don't know. But uh, you can see the Indian deaths are growing fast. The new deaths are growing fast. Uh, you know, deaths per million are still low, but there's a dynamic that's going on there that makes me hesitate to designate their performance as good performance, as an instance of uh, good performance. I think one case where we can certainly say performance is good is probably Japan. They have only eight deaths per million. A total of only 977 deaths for a nation of 126 million people. That performance is very impressive. It's not clear why they have it. Okay, it's kind of a mystery. It has to do with their being careful with respect to face masks. Their island is so densely populated, they can't afford crowding. People don't know. I read an article on Japan today. People don't know exactly why uh, their death rate is uh, so low. They don't think Japan is um, distorting the figures. They think it may be that they have a built-in immunity because in the past uh, there was a pandemic that was hitting their part, okay, of Asia. And there may be quite a few countries where people um, have an immunity to another kind of um, the coronavirus, which they had at some time in the recent past which has given them a great deal more immunity than Westerners have. <coughs> so uh, the article attributed that perhaps to a factor like that, or perhaps to some things in their diet or some things in their culture or they're being much more careful to comply with recommendations by the government to wear face masks and be careful of certain situations. But they do have that extremely good performance okay, in Japan. And another nation of 11 million people, 11.3 million people, that has great performance is Cuba. Uh, look at the number of new cases in Cuba plus three. Do I trust the statistics from Cuba? Yes, I do. I think Cuba is honest about 
its health uh, statistics mainly because they're very proud of their healthcare system. And I've read about what they're doing there and they are be being so careful to monitor uh, new cases and to contact trace very, very careful. It's wholly believable that they have only eight deaths per million population. They've performed very well, very well. Okay, and Uruguay also is known to be very careful. And they have good statistics there. They're a fairly modern place, especially for South America. And they have eight deaths per million there. South Korea, of course, is one of the most outstanding cases okay, in the world. 51 million population, only 61 new cases in South Korea. No new deaths reported. Only six deaths per million population. Only 283 total deaths. Okay, now you know that our country is at 133,000 deaths right now. We, of course, are seven times the size, nearly seven times the size of, of South Korea. But if you multiplied their total deaths by seven, uh, you would get something like 2,000 deaths. And we have 133,000 deaths. So you have to conclude that we have performed abysmally compared to South Korea, abysmally, abysmally. Unless you think there is something unique about uh, uh, the West Asian, I'm sorry, um, East Asian countries, uh, when we get to Slovakia, we find they have only five deaths per million. Of course, their uh, country is six of uh, five point um, but five million people, but that's comparable to Norway, and they have only five deaths per million. Now, maybe they're not uh, reporting their deaths. I can't talk too much about uh, their statistical system. Uh, but they're very westernized, and th that could be accurate, could be accurate. Can't really speak to it, though. Chad, now, Chad, I, I wouldn't have a great deal of confidence in their statistical system. But Singapore, very technologically sophisticated uh, country, um, the 5.8 million, only 136 new cases. Total cases in Singapore, a lot of total cases there, 44,800. The total deaths, only 26, four deaths per million. That country is performing great off that. I mean, you've got to say that. You're doing very well. I don't know whether Ghana is performing accurately, but they have reported 20,085 cases there for a country of 31 million. So they may be fooling around with the statistics. But maybe not. Uh, maybe not. They don't hesitate to report 697 uh, new cases. Only five deaths among the 600. Okay, and um, um, 97 new cases, four deaths per million. It's good performance. Also Malaysia. 
I suspect they have a pretty good statistical system too. I won't swear by it. They're at four deaths per million. Okay, lest you think this might be due in many of these cases to the fact that the country is East Asian, we now get to Australia. 25.5 million people in Australia, 8,449 8, total cases. New cases, um, 87. Australia has a very sophisticated statistical system. Four deaths per million. English-speaking country, four deaths per million. Doing far better than Canada. Now, people have been saying of Canada, well, you know, they have a Medicare for all system. That's why they're doing so much better than the United States. It may be one of the factors, but Australia has a Medicare for all system too. And where was Canada? Something like 200 deaths per million. Australia's four deaths per million. Uh uh. Australia is not so much better due to its Medicare for all system, which as far as I know, is no better, no better than Canada's Medicare for all system. Both are very good Medicare for all systems. Australia is has specifically focused on COVID-19 and isn't fooling around. That's why it got the four cases per million. Okay, and then we come to Costa Rica, not an East Asian country, but again, a fairly sophisticated country, a democratic country for years and years and years. Since I was in graduate school in the 1960s, known for its democracy, 4,996 cases reported, total cases, new cases, 375, one new death, four deaths per million in a country of 5 million people. A country of 5 million people, by the way, that's been accepting a lot of immigrants from, uh, from Nicaragua. Uh, now we come to New Zealand, another country of roughly 5 million people. Only 1,533 cases there. No new deaths. Four deaths per million population. We know New Zealand and Australia have been very strict about accepting visitors, quarantining visitors when they come in, contact tracing everything in their countries. Very, very strict. There is good performance in Australia with 25.5 million people and New Zealand with um, 5 million people. So this can't be due just to being an East Asian country. It doesn't compute. And of course, here's China. Everybody thinks China has been cheating in terms of its um, the reporting. I am not so sure. New cases plus eight, total deaths 4,634, no new total deaths reported. Only 403 active cases in the whole country. Total cases per million, only 58. Total deaths per million, only three. I won't be so sure China is lying. They were very vigorous in their response to the coronavirus. Very, very vigorous. Now, for a Latin American country, it looks like Paraguay is doing very well, 7.1 million. 
I'm not sure I trust the statistics there. They're a more impoverished country as compared to, uh, to Uruguay. I don't know if their statistical system is as good. They've reported 24, 27 cases, new cases 42. No new deaths, only three deaths per million. And they could be for real. Now, Niger and South, South of Sudan, I suspect that things can, are very biased there. COVID might not have gotten to Jamaica. I don't know what they've done there. There are 3 million people there. Only 728 total cases, plus seven um, uh, new cases. I think Jamaica's uh, statistical system is probably pretty good. They've managed to contain the virus, but of course they're a small country. Now, of course, nobody in the United States, given our current relations with Venezuela, will trust their statistical reporting here. But for what it's worth, uh, they're reporting no new cases, only 62 total deaths, only 6,750 cases overall, only 4,588 um, active cases in a country of 28 million people only two deaths per million. I would tend to doubt that, but there'll be ways of checking that after the fact, I think. Okay, Nepal, which has 29 million people, has only one death um, but per million. I don't know what to say about their statistical system. I, I cannot... I do not, you know, necessarily trust that. Of course, Jordan's figures, I don't trust either. Hong Kong's figures, I would trust. 7.5 million people in Hong Kong, 0.9 deaths per million in population, less than China. If you trust Hong Kong's reporting system, and people from the United States would probably tend to trust that, okay, a lot more than China's, they have similar results to China. China was at three deaths per million, weren't they? Yes. And when we get down to Hong Kong, we find we find 0.9 deaths um, per, um, per million. Only 106 deaths in Hong Kong out of 7.5 million people. Uh, would New York, with a similar size population, would they be happy? Oh, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. Oh, uh, would New York be happy with only seven total deaths from the coronavirus? You betcha they would. In a New York second. There are other low numbers here where the statistical system, um, I would doubt, you know, the truthfulness of the reporting. For example, Thailand, which has almost 70 million people, reports 0.8 million. Um, I'm sorry, 0 0.8, eight tenths of a person per million population. Only 58 um, the total deaths. I would doubt uh, the reliability of their reporting, but not so much Hong Kong's. But I am no expert on Thailand. I visited there once a very long time ago, 
but I haven't really kept up with what's going on with their statistical system. I do trust Taiwan's system, however. Total deaths, seven, nearly 24 million people. 0.3 deaths per million. I don't trust uh, the Myanmar system, so I will go by that. And I'll stop here. My point is, okay, my point is, there are many nations in the world that have performed oh, well when it comes to deaths per million. Many nations. Um, Vietnam, by the way, okay, has performed well according to this. They don't report any deaths at all. Hardly any cases. Of course, we probably would not trust uh, their uh, statistical system. But there are enough things here that indicate that nations of all types and of all cultural variations can get down to four deaths per million or lower, eight deaths per million, okay, or lower. Nations that are culturally dissimilar can get down to eight deaths per million, such that we have to conclude that our performance, the performance of the United States compared to other nations, the past performance, the record at this date on the bottom line indicator okay, of deaths per million, that we have among the worst records in the world and it's getting rapidly worse, rapidly worse. Let's look at the R sub T statistic. This is the key measure of how fast the virus okay, is growing. If RT is above 1.0, in other words, this is the reproduction rate okay, of the virus. The average number of people who become infected by an infectious person. If RT is above 1.0, the virus will spread quickly. When RT is below 1.0, the virus will stop spreading. I want you to look at some things now. And I think I'm still sharing the screen here. Yes, I believe I'm still sharing the screen. I'm going to look at this three months ago. Here was the virus in the United States, the r noughts in the United States. The green ovals, um, those represent uh, states that had um, R noughts less than one, so that the tendency of the virus uh, to spread was getting less. That is, the number of cases were declining. You see, how many green cases there are here. California was 0.92, the R naught estimate. Florida was 0.79. Texas was 0.9. And Missouri, Georgia, South Carolina, Pennsylvania, all under 0.1. 
There were more states under point one than there were above point one three months ago. Above point one three months ago, D.C., Virginia, state of Maine was right at point one. Kentucky was a little above. Arkansas was very slightly above at 1.02. Also, Nebraska was at 1.28. Minnesota, 1.3. New Mexico, exactly, okay, at 1.0. Well, you can see there were relatively few states. Eyeballing it, it looks like about 14, 15 states were above one. The remaining 35 states were below one in the R naught. Hawaii, by the way, was at 0.64 three months ago. Vermont was at 0.67. New York was at 0.71. That was three months ago. Okay. Now, two months ago, zap. Two months ago, fewer states, about 13 states, or at 1.0 or above, including a number that were just above, like Maine. North Carolina, North Dakota, and Tennessee, South Carolina, Arizona, Texas, and Idaho. Two months ago, the highest state, uh, Montana was 1.09. State of Alaska was 1.11, and Utah was the highest at 1.15, at 1.15. That was two months ago. In other words, at the end of April, at the end of April, one month ago, look at the vast increase in states above one. State of Minnesota went below 0.99. The Connecticut, 0.74. The Connecticut's about the, the lowest. Vermont went up to 1.02. It had been at 0.64, remember? People not worried there. Oregon now at 1.14, as of two months ago. I'm sorry, as of one month ago. Pennsylvania at 1.01. .01. But still new cases not going down in Pennsylvania. South Carolina, 1.17. Arizona, 1.18. Georgia, 1.14. And Mississippi, 1.14. Missouri, 1.16. Texas, 1.17. Oklahoma, 1.27. Almost 1.3. Hawaii spiked to 1.28. Michigan, 1.17. California, 1.1. That was just one month ago. Florida, 1.35. Nevada, 1.43. Montana, 1.36. Spiking out there. Spiking in the West. And in Florida, of course. Idaho, 1.26. You see, fewer greens than reds here. 
as of one month ago. Again, comparing it to two months ago, many more greens than reds. Between two months ago and one month ago, that turned. And the ones in green now, went to even in New York, still in green, by the way, but a 0.96. Fifteen greens, thirty-five reds, and the reds got much higher. Also, in terms of the R noughts, we really lost it between two months ago and one month ago, didn't we? Two weeks ago. Whoa, look at that. Only 12 greens now. Only 12 greens. Look at all those states in red. Well, Nevada got a little better. It was at 1.43. It's now gone to 1.36. Nevada, Montana, Wyoming, Florida. Florida, 1.30. Idaho. There's Texas, 1.14. As of two weeks ago. Arizona, 1.13. Vermont's still a little over one at 1.02. Kentucky started getting things under control. If you remember, they were over one. Two weeks ago, they were 0.97. Jersey got its act uh, together. Things are slowly declining, or were as of two weeks ago in Jersey. In Maryland, Well, Minnesota went back over one. Things slowly increasing there. A lot of these states are just at the border, not too far away from going over one. Virginia improved its standing. It had been over one. And so two weeks ago, it went down to 0.92. So that gives you the state breakdown in the United States. You can see from all the states that are over one that it looks like the prognosis for the United States is that it's going to get worse in number of new cases before it gets better. So many of the states and so many of the high population states so many of the high population states are up there, okay, over one. And New York is back over one at 1.07. D.C., on the other hand, is at 0.84. Massachusetts, 0.89. New Hampshire, 0.9. Connecticut, 0.73 estimate as of two weeks ago. Let's get the latest now. Going to the latest. Connecticut is still at 0 0.73. DC is 0.85. Massachusetts 0.90. There's New York still at 1.09, roughly the same. Kentucky. Still decreasing slowly there, but one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Only 11 states where things are declining. And they are not any of the big states. Biggest one is Illinois. And it's close to one.
Texas has climbed to 1.15. Florida, 1.3, meaning more new cases for Florida, which has spiked like crazy lately. Minnesota still at 1.06. Pennsylvania, 1.13. There are going to be new cases for Pennsylvania. There are going to be some new cases for Oregon and Washington, too. Out on the coast. California, 1.2. High. Hawaii still at 1.19. California is not as high as Florida, but it's high. It's higher than Texas. And we've been talking about very serious spikes in Texas. So with all these states, including, including many of the biggest ones, over 1.1, the future looks increasingly serious for the United States. So both on the where have we been and how are we doing right now? And what's the likely future as measured by the R sub T statistic, the reproduction rate? We are performing very badly with respect to the coronavirus. Now let's look at an article. from Common Dreams. The recent one that just appeared tonight. This was put up by the Common Dream staff and the quote is, completely out of control, China says the US epidemic, uh, uh, China says of the US epidemic is a threat to the rest of the world. And there's a graph of the seven-day average of new cases for Florida. And you see the spiking up during June. And basically doubling, more than doubling of cases during the first half of June and doubling again in the last half of June. And it hasn't stopped. A Chinese state-controlled newspaper has blamed the Trump administration's mishandling of the COVID-19 pandemic to cause the spread of the virus to go completely out of control. Describing the disease as a U.S. epidemic, the paper warned the administration's failure poses a threat to the rest of the world. Lies are dominating U.S. Uh, society's uh, 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 recognition of the epidemic, unquote, the Global Times wrote. This dramatic spike in the numbers of U.S. COVID-19 infections continues this weekend. New coronavirus cases in Florida on Sunday exceeded 10,000 in a day for the third time in the past week after the state posted a record high of 11,458 the previous day. Texas on Saturday reported 1,515 more coronavirus cases, the state's sixth straight day above 5,000. And on Friday, the Chinese Global Times published an editorial titled The Rampant U.S. Epidemic to Hurt the World. And they say the U.S. set another record for novel coronavirus cases on Thursday. Reuters reported the country confirmed more than 55,000 new COVID-19 cases uh, that day, which is a new daily global record for the pandemic. Early, earlier this week, Dr. Anthony Fauci warned that the U.S. may soon see as many as 100,000 new cases of COVID-19 a day if the tra 
uh, uh, if the trajectory of the output is not changed. And uh, Scott Gottlieb, a former commissioner for the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, said, even suggested the true number of U.S. daily infections is between 400,000 and 500,000. No, there is not enough testing to find them all. And then the China, is it, what's the newspaper again? The China Global Times says, the current epidemic in the U.S. is completely out of control. However, the U.S. federal government still insists the rapid increase in infection figures is due to more testing. Data released by the U.S. Labor Department showed the country added 4.8 million jobs in June. The White House soon boasted about its economic achievements, but people doubt whether the U.S. government is making up most efforts to rein in the virus and save more American lives. Lives. Uh, notice that the spike up in the fatalities and in the new cases suggests that those jobs are going to be peeling off again during July because people won't be going to the places that gave people those jobs. A lot of the job growth was in the hospitality industry and in various other service industries. Uh, people won't be going it will be too dangerous the white house soon boasted about its economic achievements but people got when the government uh, i read that already lies are dominating uh, u.s uh, society's uh, um, 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 recognition um, of the epidemic um, but political parties have put their interests in campaigning in the first place which has distorted the society's attention and allocation of resources. The U.S. fight against the virus is paralyzed. There is no national strategy to alleviate the epidemic. The political calculations have stunted the battle against COVID-19. Goes on to say, okay, uh, uh, but that Americans are not willing to temporarily sacrifice their freedom for the fight against the virus. The federal government has not corrected the attitude. Worse, it used the sentiment that, uh, to promote the resumption of economic activities in a risky manner. It is making ordinary people responsible for the out of control um, epidemic. The U.S. economy has slightly recovered, yet the price it is paying is too high. It will surely become a burden for the U.S.'s future economic development. And the U.S. government's approach seems to be shaping uh, um, uh, the U.S. Uh, society's greater tolerance toward the virus, making people less afraid of being infected. As the only superpower the U.S. can shape uh, 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 global public opinion as it wishes, the country has manipulated the understanding over the novel coronavirus in many societies worldwide. It has not contributed to the global fight against the crisis. On the contrary, it is setting a terrible example. No matter how the virus surfaced, the U.S. plays the most negative role in making sure the novel coronavirus spreads fast across the globe, and we are far from ending it. Can anyone in the world recall of outstanding contributions that the U.S. has made to the global efforts against COVID-19? The only thing people can remember is the U.S.'s repeated accusations against China, apart from its astonishingly large number of infections and deaths. Washington has distracted the world's attention. The U.S. is supposed to lead the world in establishing a global anti-pandemic front, but it continued to criticize the World Health Organization, um, the WHO, and announced it would sever ties with the body. As long as its epidemic continues to spread, the global antivirus fight can hardly take a fundamental turn for the better. In the coming fall and winter, the U.S. epidemic will likely run uh, rampant, 
and more countries and regions will be forced to suffer because of the U.S. So China placing the blame for future occurrences upon us. Is China right? Was that um, 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 editorial factual in what it said? You'll have to judge that for yourself. But I believe it was largely factual in that um, 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 the evaluation of China of the China Global Times here is by and large very fair. Meanwhile, Donald Trump's top trade advisor, Peter Navarro, pushed several COVID-19 conspiracy theories on MSNBC on Friday. He said that China deliberately allowed hundreds of thousands of people infected with coronavirus to leave the country to, quote, seed and spread uh, the virus abroad. I believe this is an, certainly an exaggeration. I think that statement is propaganda. Um, I don't think that China did that. Okay. And if they did, the example of Taiwan shows that even if large numbers of people were coming back from China, that it was still possible to stop the virus in its tracks. Why do I say that? Because it's a matter of record that many thousands of Taiwanese work in mainland China. And they came back to see their families. Um, but, um, um, but during the Chinese New Year this year, uh, when COVID was at its height in China, uh, they came back to Taiwan to see their families. They went through normal quarantine procedures in Taiwan. They went through the contact uh, tracing. Did not stop in Taiwan from controlling the viruses. So the spread of the virus was not due to Chinese travelers in those countries that took the proper measures to contain the, the virus. Anyway, at one point in the interview, MSNBC's uh, Ali Velshi had to ask, what are you talking about? And quote, they spawned the virus. They hid the virus. They sent hundreds of thousands of Chinese nationalists over here. Hundreds of thousands of Chinese nationals over here to America to seed and spread the virus before we knew. That sentence is certainly a lie. That never happened. They were not hundreds of thousands of Chinese national travelers over here in the United States. He claimed the virus probably came from a Chinese lab and argued, quote, this looks like a weaponized virus, unquote. And that the quote, Chinese Communist Party is responsible for forcing Americans to stay locked in our homes and lose our jobs. This is pure propaganda. There is no proof of this. This is a Trump administration lie, folks. 
Trump is looking to blame his performance in controlling the virus. Trying to blame it on China. Because he abysmally failed to control the thing. Matt O'Brien tweeted, with a population of 21 million, Florida announced 10,109 new COVID cases uh, today with a combined population of 2.6 billion China Japan Korea Vietnam um, Thailand Indonesia Malaysia the Philippines Australia and the EU are averaging and the EU too Average 6,760 new cases in the same time period. With a population more than 100 times larger, 6,760 confirmed new cases in these nations, in all of these nations. Combined. Here's a little graph from Jesse Damiani. Notice how New York's cases were declining a little or leveling out during June. While Florida's new cases starting out at nearly the same level, Texas' new cases starting out okay, at nearly the same level, both trending upward rather radically in both cases. While in New York, there's a little bit of a spike up to about 1,500 uh, new cases or something like that. And then going down again on the third and the fourth and the fifth. Hitting the peak on the third and going down the fourth and the fifth. So there you go. China starting to declare the United States a pariah that can't control the virus. The EU recently set travel restrictions on U.S. travelers. We're not welcome in the EU, EU anymore because of the performance of our government and ourselves. And ourselves. I want to call your attention okay. I want to call your attention to a column from uh, from Dave Day and on the reason why Trump is likely to lose the election. He 
he's not afraid to say at this point. He's not afraid he's going to jinx it. And Dave thinks that Trump okay, is going to lose the election. He talks about um, the importance of working hard uh, to see that, that uh, there are progressives okay, who, who um, um, and are elected um, up and down of the ballot. He says, so if you want um, the better leaders, work like hell to get them in the next four months. And yes, win big enough so it can't be stolen. Don't let me stop you. But I'm not afraid to say this. Donald Trump is going to lose. And it's critical to understand why, not just for history, but for the next occupants of the office to internalize. And baseline polling can lead us to this conclusion. And he's talking here about the Siena poll. This column was uh, from June 22nd, actually, I believe, if I can recall correctly. No, June 27th. So it's not really that old, but then he was focused on the Siena poll showing Biden ahead by 14 points, 50 to 36. Biden ahead among men, um, but, um, but tied among uh, white voters and dominant among white voters with at least some college education. In the states, so the numbers are generally the same, with Biden sporting double-digit leads in the tipping point states he needs to win. Mentions the 538 average. He mentions uh, the Pennsylvania situation is tipping um, but to Biden. He says he's not basing his prediction solely on polling. And he wasn't someone who thought Hillary Clinton was going to win in 2016. He says the main reason I say Trump will lose is that he's bad at being president. And with the coronavirus, he's found a way to be bad in public. He says it became clear to him in June that Trump, would, uh, in, in February, uh, that Trump was going to lose as cases of COVID-19 flowed out of China and around the world. He says, I knew this was a, a challenge unlike any Trump had previously faced, and that be he would fare badly at it because he's not a good president. He said, plenty of leaders have failed during the pandemic. What Andrew Cuomo did to send sick patients back into nursing homes was unforgivable. But I think we can agree that a president has more agency than anyone else in moments of natural crisis. From the very beginning, Trump tried to push off that responsibility to the states because of his aversion to being blamed for anything. But responsible he is in numerous ways. And Dave points to the CDC botching testing and uh, to Trump's admitting he deliberately slowed testing at key points to make the numbers look better that he actively cheered for a reopening way too soon and offered no federal support for states to prepare. Um, but Dave points to the FEMA program of commandeering and shuffling uh, by personal protective equipment. And he said, um, he says the FEMA program for doing this was the work of a criminal gang. He said his attitude toward the virus, Trump's attitude was to dismiss its grave implications even now amid the unending first wave. Yes, it was even on exhibit this past weekend when he had his pandemic party at the White House on July 4th with the military flyovers. Uh, but even now amid the unending first wave. Trump's campaign managers in quarantine and advanced staffers have contracted the disease 
And Dave says, Trump's approach is crumbling around him and the continual pronouncements of the great job he's doing amid 125,000 deaths and untold long-term damage to people's lungs and their livelihood recalls Nero and the fiddle. He says, Americans habit habitually reject incompetence in their leaders. Before being feted as a kindly painter, George W. Bush was the most loathed man in the country because he got us bogged down in a war based on lies, um, 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 let an American city drown and presided over a crushing financial crisis. He was bad at his job in public. Herbert Hoover was bad at his job as millions suffered during the presidency shaped um, by, by the depression. But the nation rejected him. They're in the process of uh, rejecting Trump. He says there's a way for a hypothetical president to succeed in the next four months and eke out a re-election um, by universal masking massive support for testing in army field hospitals and contact tracing where needed, a wide open money spigot to individuals financially affected. It's actually a pretty simple formula, but Dave says Trump won't do it. He's taken the position that everything's fine and thinks that moving off that would show weakness. And even if he wanted to do what might seem simple for a replacement level president, He's so far below that standard as to make such steps impossible. This is why he should actually resign, as Chris Hayes called for yesterday. Instead, we'll have to settle for him being snubbed at the polls in four months. I raise a question there. Why will we have to settle? Why can't we insist right now that it is impossible for him to be president any longer. Why can't we deluge the vice president with mail from all over the country, insisting that Donald Trump is incompetent to be the president of the United States and that the 26th Amendment be used to remove him Right now, if we get enough pressure calling for the 26th Amendment to be used, why would it not be used if the pressure were heavy enough? Why do we have to wait for four months? What kind of damage can he do to us in the next four months? What kind of damage will he do to us in the next four months? He and his administration are forcing people out there to go to work in the middle of this spiking of new cases in three of our most populous states. Things are spiking in California, they're spiking in Texas, they're spiking in Florida. Thank God they're not spiking in New York anymore. They're spiking in Arizona too, but that's a relatively small population state compared to the others. But you saw the R noughts. You saw how many states have appreciable, have appreciable reproduction rates over one. The curves in those states have to be bent. And Trump won't use the formula that you just heard from Dave Dan. I don't understand why people have this mindset that we have to wait for the election in four months. That the president can be impeached. There is Amendment 26 that can be used. Whether these things will happen depend on pressure that we can put on, that we should put on. 
we shouldn't sit back and wait for the election. We should put the pressure on. Trump's entire political career has been built on hucksterism and grievance. You can fool people with hucksterism for a long time, but not one slap by reality. Then the sheen wears off, BSing his way through serve Trump well in business, which we're discovering is much more forgiving than government. But you can only whine for so long, as Biden noted yesterday, before it becomes pathetic. Trump can't figure out how to attack the coronavirus. And without doing that work, he can't attack Joe Biden. He knows he's going to lose. Quote, um, a Biden quote is going to be president because some people don't love me, maybe, unquote, he said to Sean Hannity on Friday. Because he's incapable of the governing that would prevent it. This is the important point. The president has to be president, not just play one on TV. They cannot just express competence, but actually succeed. The difficult truth is that Trump is carrying on a tradition. We've done very little to arrest our long-term crisis for several decades. And here, Dave, is talking more to the performance point. For decades, our political system has not been performing well for most of the people. And we keep trying in wave elections to get a better result by replacing the elites. Remember, the Obama election was a wave election. Remember, the congressional election of 2010 was a wave election. Remember Trump's election in 2016 was also a wave election. Then there was a wave election in 2018. Why did people elect Trump? Because they wanted to shake up the system. But they knew well into 2017, they hadn't really shaken it up. They knew that. That's why the Democrats had such a big victory in 2018. But since then, things have been getting even worse for Trump. And still, the voters are searching for a real change to the system. It's so unfortunate, so unfortunate that uh, the primary voters are unwilling, unwilling to go that far. When the coronavirus hit, they retreated to Biden and wouldn't go for Bernie, who would have made those changes. Now they'll vote for Biden in hopes that he will change things. I don't know if he will, but the best way to guarantee that he will is to work now to get Trump out of there before the election. Before the election. Not only to stop of the damage that Trump keeps doing each day he's in office, but also to place new pressure on Biden that he has to run on something. But to get back to the point, we've done very little to arrest our long-term crises for several decades. That speaks to the competence of our political system and ourselves as uh, citizens, our unwillingness to throw enough people out to cause change. 
we're still tending to vote for the incumbents when they run for Congress and for state legislature. We're voting for people who've been in politics for 20, 30 years or people who basically run on the same things that the people who've been in for 20 or 30 years um, have been running on. We need to put in entirely new people who are not part of the system that has failed us. We need a real electoral revolution when November comes around. But even before that, we need to have Trump dismissed to stop the daily damage. It's getting more and more serious. Dave says the next president needs to actually deal with these long-term crises. FDR's descendants wrote an open letter to Biden urging outsized ambition to fill in the existing cracks exposed by this crisis. Passivity at income and wealth inequality, at unequal treatment, at structural racism, at a raging pandemic, but also the everyday failures we faced before will only lead to disapproval and decline. So when Biden wins, he needs to salve the festering wound that is American government. Well, we'll get another in a series of wave elections that haven't really ended since 2006. Trump's humiliating defeat sets the course for Biden's presidency. Um, um, the tangibly govern, says Dave, and says me, um, to Biden. Trump tangibly govern. He had a party last night. To my knowledge, he's not having a party tonight. Okay, so I want to move to your comments now. Obviously, I haven't finished what I plan for tonight. So I'm going to continue part two of this topic tomorrow night. And then after I finish with this topic uh, later on this week, I'm going to answer the call okay, I've been receiving to start on at least one of my books as the topic of some live streams. So I do intend to do that. But I'm going to continue this topic, okay, for next time because there's a lot of news that okay, is bearing upon it. And because the issue of trying to evaluate what condition we're in, in a comparative context to other nations, is so very important in terms of motivating us the way things should, should towards what ought to be specifically okay, an overall rejection of those people who have been running um, our government. So next time, we still have to talk about the economy, more on government performance, what's been going on with our civil liberties and rights. We have to touch on Medicare for all, and we have to discuss the lack of representation we suffer because we now have an oligarchy and not a democracy. So all that will be covered um, tomorrow. So thank you for coming. And I'll take on your comments now. And questions. 
<laughs> Kay says, I stayed in the house. Dan Going said, if we don't protect our freedoms and liberties, they can be took in from us. Was a stroke of a pen. As we speak, uh, governors are breaking laws left and right, um, but going against the people who elected them, which is treason. No, it's not treason because there's no war involved. Treason was carefully defined by the Constitution, so, okay, it's not treason. It is, however, it does, however, involve uh, the violations of the Constitution and the police all over the country are violating the Constitution every single day. They need to be defunded, as they say. Steve Gonzo says, I've restocked. Begin the two-week count. What have you restocked with, Steve? And Joe Segura says, two-week count for the numbers to explode? I don't know. Could be, could be three weeks. Oh, the incubation period. Yes. Kay says numbers are going up in Ohio too. Yeah. Uh, the R naught for Ohio was higher than one, as I showed you in the graphics. So that's certainly happening. Steve Wolfbrand says hi, Doc. Hi, Steve. K Clark Ryan says hi, Evelyn and Steve. Hi, K. Almost one in four testing positive in Houston. Oh, SMH, says Steve, Texas, high rate of infection in Texas. Okay, says, I heard that, Steve. And Claudia Seifer, Seifer says, checking in here from San Francisco. Nice to see you, Claudia. Welcome. Deborah says, I'm here in the North Bay right now. In North Bay, huh? Even Lena says, uh, UK media signaling Spain as if the Brits were doing such a wonderful job regarding COVID. Is it racism? Jabs at the left government there? Probably both. Yeah, it's both. Of course, we see we saw that the Brits were not doing such a good job. What was it? 657 uh, deaths per million? If I recall correctly, for the Brits, that's what the figure was showing, wasn't it? Of course, the Brits have bent uh, the curve um, 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 actually right now. But uh, yeah, the UK was at 651 deaths per million. Spain was only at 607 deaths. I shouldn't say only. That's a very high figure. But uh, uh, deaths per million came in the UK uh, was higher than anybody in a major country except for Belgium that had 843 deaths per million. So certainly, uh, okay, I think the UK always jabs at Spain. They still think that Spain is an underdeveloped country. Uh, compared to the UK. They haven't been to Barcelona lately. Russ says, the U.S. wants to match Italy, Spain, and the UK. Okay, it's a race for excellence. Oh, you mean a race for excellence in deaths per million? Evelina says, in Argentina, cases came in Buenos Aires province, especially in the autonomous city of Buenos Aires with the right-wing government, Suppose there is a connection there. There is. <laughs> Evelina says in the city, okay, of Buenos Aires. Buenos Aires, a great city. And Joanne says a 45 is killing his base with divisive rhetoric. Okay, says Cuba seems to have a handle on it, um, but pretty good, yeah. They're using their uh, uh, interferon um, as an antiviral. They've been using it for years. They get um, the, um, the, a pretty good success. Even when it says, but you're right, Dr. Joe, the Southern Cone was praised by the New York Times when they aren't doing so great. Here, failed to mention Cuba and Venezuela. 
two, con two countries doing significantly better than any in uh, Latino America. Yes, I don't know whether the, Venus, uh, uh, the Venezuelan statistics can be counted uh, well because of uh, the, uh, the Barrios in uh, uh, the Caracas, okay, and in uh, some of the other cities. It's very hard to measure things there, um, hard to count things there. Okay, I know there are local communities there. Um, um, have committees very much in touch with uh, the populace, but the issue is whether they're classifying fatalities uh, um, 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 in connection with the proper diseases actually causing fatalities. So I don't know whether Venezuela has okay, as good a record as they seem to be reporting. Uh, that said, they have had the assistance of Cuban doctors there for some time to cope with, uh, with COVID. So uh, even though they may not be doing as well as they claim, they still may be doing better than most of the rest of Latin America or South America. Steve says, the Japanese don't shake hands and wear face masks. I know, Steve. I know. And they bow. Steve says, Cuba, New Zealand. Evelina says, New Zealand isn't in Latin America. No, it's in Anglo America. <laughs> no, not really. It's not America, but it's Anglo. It's an Anglo country, Australia, okay. Anglo, English speaking. English speaking countries with a tradition of government derived from the UK. And Steve Gonzo has an article on Nobel Peace Prize Cuban Health Solidarity Workers have earned it. Yes, they have, Steve. Evelina says, Costa Rica, that country with no army? Right. Exactly. Costa Rica has been doing fine. Okay, says so Scott and I talked about going to Costa Rica years ago. I wish we had now. Okay, says so if we had gone there, he might still be alive now. Yeah, they have a very good health care system there. There is a universal coverage there. Even if it's such a tiny country, if we all went there, they'd sink into the sea, laugh out loud. Evelina says, it's probably best we all um, um, leave them alone, laugh out loud. Evelina says, oh, okay, I'm sure he was one of those people who deserved to go there. Okay, so it's back when we talked about it, it wasn't that way. I didn't want to go because I would miss my family, but now my family has deserted me anyway. SMH. Evelina says, a lovely guy, judging from who you are. Kay says, he was an old country-raised hippie like me. Evelina says, the best. Kay says, yes, we were a good pair. Evelina says, he could have contributed to community there. Kay says, yes, both of us were organic gardeners and wildlife savers. Steve says, we reopened too soon. You think? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we closed too late and we reopened too soon. Russ says, my state, that's Georgia, is skyrocketing. My county is leading the state with infection numbers. So far, I'm surprised we aren't seeing hospitalizations and death rates uh, spiking. Yes, when you go to your appointments, Russ, you have to be very, very careful. But you know that. I'm sure you know that. And Greg says, uh, you're okay. in Gwinnett County. Greg says, our idiot governor, Brian K.K. Kemp, lifted the shelter in place orders too early and reopened businesses entirely too prematurely. 
and Russell says, I can't find the numbers you were looking at. The screenshot is not uh, scrolling anymore. Hang on a second. Let me find the R rate uh, for, uh, for Georgia for you. Let me get this going here. Is the RT again. Let me see if I can find what the reproduction rate is for Georgia. Ah. The reproduction rate for Georgia is 1.14. That's the estimate actually right now. That is uh, that okay is pretty appreciable. It's interesting in Georgia when the sheltering in place uh, uh, ended, the R rate in Georgia was. Um, um, 0.89 as of April 30th. It quickly went above one um, as of May 7th. It went to one and uh, then it went to it went to 1.14, and it's pretty much steady at 1.13, 1.14. Since uh, June 7th, since June 7th, and before then, okay, it was a little lower, it gradually rose. Um, but, um, but through May, but from June 7th up to the present, it's been at 1.14. That's an appreciable rate of spread. That's why you're seeing new cases spiking in Georgia. Greg says, the county to the southwest of me here in Georgia is a rural Georgia hotspot for COVID-19. Too many idiots not doing the right thing. Yeah, they think it's macho to go without a mask. Russ says, people doing church, and funerals. And they're getting a lot more church and a lot more funerals, right? Joanne says, Trump needs to stop campaigning in Arizona. Greg says churches should be ordered to shut down along with dining restaurants, bars, gyms, and other places where large crowds can gather. Absolutely. Kay says the wine was doing good here in Ohio until armed um, protests turned up at the state house and the med the director's house too. She finally quit as she was afraid for herself and her family. SMH. The South doesn't have the corner market on dumb rednecks. And Greg says those idiots uh, should have been arrested and their guns confiscated. I agree, Greg, but this is a, a GOP ruined state. What can I say? Joanne says anyone unmasked, spitting, or coughing on people should be arrested and prosecuted for assault. Absolutely. Evelina says there are plenty of dumb city slickers for that matter on the coasts, Evelina says. On the coast, too. On the coast, not just a rural matter. Kay says, I don't know about that as I've never lived in any coastal states except North Carolina. It was a blue state when I went there and totally different um, than now since it has been GOP ruined too. Where are you, Evelina? Evelina says, I have people in New York. You weren't there though. Evelina might be in Argentina. Joanne says, my sister left Arizona to go home in upstate New York or yesterday. She had to complete contact tracing forms on the plane. We have been quarantining in Arizona, and she will continue to do so. Arizona is not a very safe place right now. It's gone way above one also. 
Evelyn says heart and mind. Kay says, uh, but New York is pretty corrupt too, though. Yes, but they've bent the curve in New York. Facebook just tagged my post sharing Willie Nelson's Music Fest I shared yesterday. ASMH. Who hates Willie? Evelyn says, pretty and corrupt. Laugh out loud. Evelyn says, I like Willie. Who doesn't like Willie? Deborah says, please God, Trump must lose. Deborah says, we need a replacement for Sleepy Joe. And me too, Evelyn. I saw him many times years ago in concert here in Ohio. She so says, I won't vote for Biden. Epstein didn't kill himself. Joanne says, Sanders. Evelyn says, hashtag bring back Bernie. Evelyn says, Nero and the fiddle. And Kay says, Willie is as close as I get to liking country music. Steve says, so we are in combined first and second waves. No, still in the first wave. Steve, we never ended the first wave. That's the problem. Joanne says, still first wave. Deborah says, we can and we should. Deborah says, reject Joe. Joanne says, forcing working poor back to work. Evelyn says, don't have to accept a, a Biden either. Where is the pressure to make him step down? Well, since Joe isn't in the presidency yet, it's hard to get people excited about uh, getting him to step down. He's not doing anything to hurt people yet, other than what he's already done by doing everything he can to cheat the Bernie Sanders out of it. Evelina says, where's the pressure on Biden, Dr. Joe? Well, you'd have to go to Biden's house and camp out there in Delaware in extremely large numbers to get pressure on him. That's what would have to be done. You'd have to see if you could practice free speech and assembly there. Okay, says Biden needs to go for Medicare for all at least. The majority of all parties want it now. Not only that, 85% of the Democratic Party wants that now tomorrow i'm going to be talking about a tweet uh, that i recently circulated Well, the tweet said, how long can at Speaker Pelosi, at Senator Schumer, and at Joe Biden, who oppose um, um, hashtag Medicare for all, hashtag a wealth tax, um, um, hashtag um, a Green New Deal, hashtag student debt cancellation, Continue to lead a political party where support for each of these ranges from 88% for Medicare for all to 75%. All should announce their commitment to these positions or retire now. So among other things, we'll be talking about that particular tweet tomorrow. Yes. 88% of Democrats support Medicare for all. 88% okay, of Democrats. So with that as a parting word,
Oh, gee, I had a whole bunch of. A whole bunch of comments here that I missed. That I just saw. I thought I had completed everything, and then I got a whole bunch of comments that came in. Uh, okay, Evelina says, um, not even enough, K. The Green New Deal is just as urgent for jobs and climate. K says, I agree with that too, Evelina. Matarato says, I don't think a Biden victory is going to make any substantive change in the oligarchy. Wall Street and the war machine will continue to murder, oppress, and exploit. They control the legislation, the regulatory agencies, um, the judiciary, and the Fed. Uh, well, if they do make any changes, it's going to be because we are camping out on their doorstep until they make those changes. We are going to have to be in the streets. Hopefully, we can do a better job in the streets under Biden than we can under the Republicans. Steve says, we are so fucked. I'm very depressed. Me too, Steve. Can't afford to be, can't afford to be depressed. Joanne says, Steve Wolfbrandt, me too. Pure madness. Margo Shepard said, haven't had an opportunity to check in with you for a while. Glad to hear your thoughts. Heartening as usual. Thank you, Margo. Nice to see you. Joanne says, interferon can cause issues also. I took the treatment for hep C twice. It did not um, give me long-term uh, results and side effects were right. Well, um, but Cuba has their own brand of interferon viral that they've been developing for a long, long time. I don't know if you took that, uh, Joanne, but they supposedly get extremely good results with that. Deborah says he's not your friend. He only wants the insurance industry to keep rolling in the big bucks, so that so does he. Well, that is right. Steve Gonzo said, considering only 5% of the population has been tested, actual numbers are minus 95%. Case says, a long and short of the question, how are we performing piss poor is the answer. Stephanie said, sorry, I didn't know there was a show. I've been sick with another kidney infection going to the hospital in the morning. Oh, sorry to hear that, Stephanie. Stephanie says Arkansas is still doing okay so far. Stephanie says, um, I'll share. How is Arkansas doing? Uh, let me see. Okay, Arkansas has a current estimate of 1.02 for the reproduction rate of okay, the virus, meaning that it is spreading slowly in Arkansas, but it is spreading. And the number of new cases in Arkansas, generally speaking, is slowly increasing, according to the statistics from uh, the world don't meet her. Evelina says, I'm getting seasick. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Stephanie. Share to my largest groups. Steve says, I'm with you there. Was just too afraid to say it out loud until now. Evelina says, are you okay now, Joanne? I hope so. Evelina says, I refuse to get the depressed Steve very pissed off, though. Stephanie said, I'm depressed, too. Just didn't want to say it out loud for some reason. And Evelina says, don't hurt sad, get mad. And Stephanie said, thank you for checking Arkansas, Dr. Joe. Evelina says, glad you're better, Stephanie. Okay, I'm sorry to hear that you're going back into the hospital, though, tomorrow, Stephanie. We're going back to see the doctor anyway. Okay, good luck, Stephanie. Be well. 
And good night, everybody. It's 11.05. It's my time to say good night. Kay says, thank you all for another great uh, discussion. I missed you all last night. <laughs> and Deborah says, love to all. Thank you, Deborah. Good night.